What happens when the most powerful computer on the market is released and it got everything wrong? Let's find out. Hi, I'm Jacob with Tandy Lab, and today we are looking at the infamous Tandy 2000. In 1981, International Business Machines released the IBM 5150. They had been the market leader for mainframe computer systems for several decades, and this would be their response to the emerging market of computers small enough to fit on a desk, like Tandy's TRS-80 and the Apple II. What was created was a business-orientated system made mostly from off-the-shelf components, powered by the very impressive Intel 8088 CPU. Paired with MS-DOS, a disk-based operating system with a fascinating history of its own, the IBM PC was set to be the standard for business computers. I hear you typing, Oh, but Jacob, the 5150 came with PC-DOS and not MS-DOS. And to that I say, I don't care! The name difference between MS-DOS and PC-DOS is arbitrary 99.99999% of the time. Now, back on track. 1983 is an important year for the PC platform. It hadn't quite become the ubiquitous system of the everyman yet, but was selling well enough that many companies hoped to copy their success. These would be the first IBM PC clones. Enter Tandy, owner of Radio Shack and producer of the popular TRS-80 computer line and the more recent color computer line. Tandy wanted a new platform for the high-end computer user base since their current offerings like the TRS Model 4 or the Tandy 6000 were becoming less relevant in an IBM-run world. Tandy set their sights on making a system able to run software written for the PC, while being cheaper, easier to upgrade, and most importantly, more powerful. That system would be the Tandy TRS-80 2000. Branding-wise, the Tandy 2000 was a transitionary system. All computers Tandy released before it used the TRS-80 branding, even if they had nothing to do with the actual TRS-80 line. Systems released after the 2000 would almost always use the Tandy name for branding. The 2000 uses both. In fact, it's the only system Tandy ever released with both the TRS-80 and Tandy branding on its badge. The Tandy TRS-80 2000 is a bit of a mouthful, so we're going to shorten it to either the Tandy 2000 or just the 2000 from here on out. Released at a starting price of $24.99 with two disk drives or $39.50 with a 10 megabyte hard drive, the Tandy 2000 would be fairly price competitive with the PC even the newer PC XT model. Many PC configurations would run thousands of dollars more than the 2000, even after factoring in the additional purchase of graphics cards and monitors. Now, the story of the 2000 is many things, but most important is the story of the CPU at the heart of the system. Rather than use the same iconic CPU setup as the IBM PC, an Intel 8088 CPU running at 4.77 MHz, Tandy would use the newer, more advanced Intel 8186, or 186 CPU for short. Intel designed the 186 as a next generation replacement for the 8086 and the 8088, coming out three years after them in 1982. It was designed to include many functions that previously would have required separate chips like clock generation, direct memory access, and wait state generation. It also added many new useful instructions to the 8086 instruction set, it ran at a much faster base clock speed, and it even handled instructions much more efficiently than the older chips. Stock 186 chips ran at 6 MHz. Tandy's implementation would run at an increased 8 MHz, making the Tandy 2000 one of the fastest personal computers on the planet. The performance over a standard PC, even the brand new upgraded IBM PC XT, was staggering, and that would be the primary selling point of the 2000. There was just one teeny 
tiny problem. A massive one, actually. You see, the 186 wasn't exactly compatible with the older 8088. It sometimes was, but sometimes wasn't. Tandy didn't think this was a big deal since the concept of software being intercompatible between many different computer systems was still in its infancy. This would prove to be a bad choice. Even worse, the primary reason Tandy sacrificed compatibility was for the increased performance. That decision would look even more foolish just two months after the 2000s release when Intel revealed their next, next generation chip, the 286. Stock 286 chips would run almost as well as the overclocked 186 in the Tandy and were fully compatible with the 8088, yikes. Now in its defense, the 186 isn't a bad chip. It was just the wrong chip for the job. It was actually very popular as an integrated component for its intended use, as a all-in-one chip for embedded systems. In fact, Intel would continue producing the 186 all the way up till September 2007, a full 25 years after it was released. But the CPU wasn't the only design element that Tandy would come to regret. In fact, Nearly all of the stellar features that Tandy hoped would make the system the clear choice over the competition would directly be the cause of headaches for 2000 owners. Like, sure, it was impressive that the 2000 came with two pre-installed disk drives at a time where many computers didn't even have one, but they were proprietary quad-density 720K drives making the transfer of software to systems other than other Tandy 2000s nearly impossible. Another case of Tandy trying to do extra and thus shooting themselves in the foot was the 2000s graphics. They were really impressive, really, really impressive, able to even go up to a full resolution of 640 by 400 with eight on-screen colors from a palette of 16. That's years ahead of any other computer available at the time, but they were again proprietary. Software would have to be written specifically for the 2000 to take advantage of them, something that rarely happened. Tandy really pushed in ads that the 2000 was DOS compatible and like a PC-80. That was quite the stretch. In reality, only a tiny percentage of PC software would run on a 2000. It was pretty much only text-only programs that didn't use any programming tricks that relied on the typical register configuration of the PC that would work. It's a pretty small list. That means the Tandy 2000 would live or die based on the software specifically written for it, or ported to it that would be sold exclusively at Radio Shack. That library was small. While developers were shipping out PC-compatible software like their lives depended on it, the 2000 had at most 40 titles specifically written for it. Finding an exact number can be hard since many of those included in software lists were just PC titles that happened to be compatible. That being said, despite the library's pitiful size, I have to give it some praise. This really is a case of quality over quantity. There's some fantastic software here. Several of the most popular programs of the time were available directly from Tandy, like Lotus 123, SuperCalc, Tandy's own Deskmate, and even a version of the GEM operating environment. The 2000 was also a fantastic system for graphic design or CAD work, at least for a while, thanks to fast rendering from the powerful CPU and the high-resolution graphics. Complementing this, Tandy eventually sold both a two-button mouse and a graphics tablet for the system. It would remain a fairly good choice for the design industry before being made completely irrelevant by newer systems like the Macintosh and the Amiga. By far the most interesting supporter of the 2000 was... Microsoft. Microsoft made sure to port as much of their library to the 2000 as possible. There's the usual stuff, you know, like Microsoft Word and several Microsoft published code compilers, but even Microsoft Flight Simulator made an appearance. 
The most interesting thing is that Microsoft also wrote the original beta versions of a little obscure program called Windows for the Tandy 2000. Windows was developed side by side for both the PC and the Tandy 2000, with most of the development being done on 2000s, since they were quite common in the Microsoft Office. There's even this famous picture of Bill Gates sitting in front of a 2000 with Windows development going on on it. Pretty cool. Two beta versions of Windows were released for the 2000 as the first way for developers to test out what Windows could do. But even by then it was clear that the poor sales of the 2000 would push development of Windows to the PC. The only retail release of 2000 Windows was version 1.01 versus the PC family, which would see like a million different releases. Although Tandy and their software partners tried their hardest to carve out a professional niche for the 2000, it just didn't pan out. The 2000 would actually remain on sale for years, but not because it sold well. It was actually due to Tandy drastically overestimating demand and producing a massive overstock of units. Even keeping it on sale for years after production stopped and selling it for massive discounts, Tandy wasn't able to get rid of the backlog, so they ended up ripping most of the components out and using them as employee store operations terminals. When I was looking into these terminals, I brought them up to my dad, who worked at Radio Shack in the early 1990s, and he had vivid memories of them running the store off of one of these 2000s stored in the back of the store, which were wired to the now very rare Tandy WS-1000 in the front of the store, which was a similar stripped down store terminal based on the much later Tandy 1000 SL. Tandy would learn from the mistakes of the 2000 and from then on would no longer try to reinvent the wheel and instead focus on making a normal wheel just one that was better and cheaper. In fact, their next release, the Tandy 1000, would succeed in every area that the 2000 failed in. If you want to know how a simple PC Junior clone could become a massive success and start one of the longest lasting computer lines of all time, check out our video, How Tandy Beat IBM at Their Own Game, The Story of the Tandy 1000. Our Tandy 2000 was an extremely good deal. We picked it up for $95 shipped. It was supposed to come with the keyboard, but the seller forgot it and ended up shipping the keyboard separately to us a few weeks later. At least we got it in the end. On the front of our system, you can see the Tandy badge, very prominent power switch, reset switch, and the dual disk drives. The first thing you'll notice on the back of the system is the strange format that the 2000 used for its expansion cards. With these very narrow slide-in card slots, there aren't very many cards that were made compatible with this setup, and they are pretty rare now. Also on the back is the rather beefy fan, power in and power out for a monitor, and on the bottom row there's the proprietary serial port, proprietary printer port, and the monochrome monitor out. You'll notice that we are actually missing a dedicated graphics card for this system, something we're currently trying to track down. And now for the ratings. Usability, two out of five. This shouldn't be a surprise. Proprietary ports and expansions everywhere, and the very frustrating disk drives bring this one down pretty hard. Oh, and I didn't find a place to mention it, but the 2000 has a very limited number of supported monitors. Stick to a Tandy CM1 or don't bother. Rarity, five out of five. Despite being on sale for over five years, Tandy sold very few 2000s. No surprise that very few exist in good condition in modern times. Price, one out of five. Seriously, these things get expensive. We lucked out getting one within our budget, but that's mostly because we sat and waited patiently for a good deal for quite a long time. Aesthetics, three out of five. It's a fine looking computer, just fine. Yeah, I don't have anything else to say about it. It's just average looking. Software, 
zero out of five. Yeah, I really wanted to give it a higher number since the software that is there is pretty interesting, but this is more about what's not there, which is basically everything. So what do you think of the Tandy 2000? Do you praise it because of its ambitiousness? Do you scorn it because of its many issues? Have you never even heard of the Tandy 2000? Let us know in the comments down below. Please make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Also, we have a Discord server where we talk about retro tech every day. Make sure to join that. Uh, you can also support us on Patreon. And also, check out our Facebook and Twitter. And I'll see you guys next time.